Hey everyone, and welcome to the new and improved um, Cold SE webinar system. If you'll notice the fancy little belt packs. Notice the fact that mine's camouflaged. I'm yeah. the hunter of the group. He's the uh, gatherer. There you go, I, I have it right out here. <laughs> so we're trying out a new audio system. I know if you haven't been here uh, before that it won't make a big deal, but this should do, do us uh, much better on recording. You should see the fancy setup we have now. So hopefully we'll get a good recording of this for you guys, for everybody that comes after. Um, tonight we are here uh, to let Don Copeland uh, go through a presentation and go through the differences between the uh, the brother, the Epson line of direct garment printers, and our own DTG brand here at Cold Essie. So pay no attention to Don Copeland at this moment. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what I'm going to do this time is I'm foregoing my usual, uh, you know, recommendations to join our Facebook group, go to caswebinars.com, and go to caspodcast.com. Because I know that most of you already do that, and I'm going to send you a bunch of emails anyway. Um, so uh, without uh, delaying any further, I'm going to let uh, Don Copeland show oh, you the difference in DTG printers. Get the printer going. No, we're going to we're going to do we're going to do oh, this. Wow, we're going to get this going, huh? Definitely. <laughs> there we go. And there are a lot of other people that are making comments now, and they know because you know they can't hear. All righty, you guys can't hear. All right. Well, while we're talking, I want to get Ethan here to clear up the air. I don't know where he kicked the cable or loose or something. I'm back, guys. So, welcome to Cold Etsy tonight. We're going to talk. There's a bunch of you guys online. This is awesome. We've got a bunch of folks online right now. And uh, we, we want to talk to you a bit about a comparison that most frequently we hear in the sales room about what printers I'm looking at this printer, I'm looking at that printer. You need to talk that's online. Oh, okay. There we go. Hey, guys. Um, <laughs> when I talk to people, most commonly I ask them, so what other printers are you looking at? Most common answers would be the Brother and the Epson printer versus one of our two printers here, which actually they kind of match up pretty nicely back and forth between the, I think when you're looking at the Epson, more than likely you need to be looking at the Viper 2. If you're looking at one of the Brother printers, especially the 381 and the 361, you're probably looking at our M2 because they kind of fall in the same ranges for their productivity and their output capabilities. Um, Apologies, we've been we've been playing around around so much with our uh, microphones, we forgot to configure both of the printers. We we plug these printers into multiple machines. What he's doing in the background here, even though in your world he's in the foreground, he's in my world he's in the background because uh, we're looking at a screen right now for there we go. Get that one going too. All right, and I just wanted to get both of the printers printing so that we can show you one of the big differences. All right, that we have. All right, now we're going, we're rocking and rolling, and I'm going to go ahead and close this screen out so that I can see you guys seeing me. And hopefully you're seeing me. And there's my snowflake, and I'm back. There we go. Sorry for the delay. I wanted to get both printers printing. All right, so start off with, there is nothing wrong with the Brother machine, and there is nothing wrong with the Epson machine. I want to go on record as saying that. They're both good machines. They're both very valid machines. Uh, no doubt about it. Now, I'm, what I'm here to do is compare the differences between the different machines, all right, and allow you to kind of make your own judgments of where you think they seem to fit in. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased about what machines I think are best fit. Definitely. However, that's that's what I get paid to do. I get paid yeah, to be exactly. biased, right? However, I, I want everybody to know, if you've got an Epson machine or a brother machine, I'm not here to bash it. Um, if you have a brother machine you're looking for a second, you're at the right place, Paul. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, let's start off with some of the basics of the machine. What's different about the machine? One of the things is going to be the footprint of the machine, because in a lot of cases you have to really weigh in all of these things. This is a, so we turn wrong when I turn it, I'm looking at the screen here. You look at the, the M2, you look at the Brother, and you look at the Epson printers, they're big suckers, right? right? Big footprints, um, so I'm not compared, if you're looking at where space is not a problem, then those three machines are all, they fit, right? If you're looking at a machine you're going to go portable with, a machine that you're going to run in your home, we have a lot of folks in this industry who run businesses from their homes, yeah, right? There's there's only one printer of the four of them that will fit through a normal door, and that would be on this side, all right? Um, on this side, which is the, the Viper 2. The Viper 2 is less than 32 inches wide. It will go through every standard door. About the only kind of doors we find they won't go through 
would be like RV doors and things like that. But for a normal house, for a normal business setup, the Viper 2 is definitely going to be the most portable, the most mobile to get in and out uh, of different areas. Now, doesn't mean you can't take the other machines mobile. I actually have folks asking me about taking, you know, they told me that they take their, their Epson printer mobile. However, you can't go through a normal door. You actually have to turn the machine sideways to go through doors, yeah. which means you have to be more concerned about your wasting and just the logistics of turning the printer sideways, not damaging it when you're, when you're turning it back either way. So if you're doing a lot of events, you know, you go to fill in the blank, whether it's a dog show, horse show, little league events, anything like that, right? Then what you, you probably want to look at pretty seriously, this side, would be the it's Viper, Viper 2. Two yeah. Wow. I see a little arrow that says flips up here, so I remember that I'm, I'm backwards, okay? Another <laughs> thing, with it, that everybody <laughs> thinks of me as backwards, is going to be the weight. Uh, when you look at the Brother and you look at the M2, they're heavy machines. They're both over 200 pounds. Uh, even on the, and I wrote down some numbers, so I keep track of all of these. You know, even on, when, when you look at the M, the Viper 2, it's still a machine of two people. It's like 140 pounds or so, and you're looking slightly heavier with the Epson. So those two machines are going to, uh, my voice is tenny and loud. Uh, can we turn off, uh, back off mic or turn volume down? How about I move it down a little bit? Does everybody else hear me all right or not? You sounded okay on my system. Okay. There we go. We'll try that a little bit lower. I do talk pretty loud anyway. We've never had problems with my recordings, right? Not sounding right. So we may have to tone me down and put a little switch, switcheroo left and right, right on me on here. Um, there you go. You're welcome. Uh, so, I mean, those are kind of some made, some standard comparisons between the machines. All of them given the same graphic with the same T-shirt with an equally skilled operator are going to produce excellent output for sale. They would not be on the market if they weren't that way, all right? So we're going to start to compare what's the differences, how do you weigh in what makes the most sense for your business. And we start off, first off, with a dealing with, to me, where I think that we, we kind of excel, but it's, it's just something to compare. What I've chosen here for files to print are files that kind of differentiate us from the rest of the players in the marketplace. Both of the main players on the marketplace, the brother and... The Epson, by the way, we spared all expense in this problem <laughs> I'm about to show you, right? The print area on both the Epson and the Brother that comes standard is 14 by 16, all right? It's not made out of plywood, though. <laughs> um, so this is the standard print size on both of those machines. Both of those machines do give you an option to buy an oversized. On the Epson, you can go up to a, a 16 by 20. And you can go up to a 16 by 18 on the brother. They are optional. They do cost additional money. All right. When you have, they finish up just on cue, yeah, right. perfectly that on cue. All right. With the both the, M, Viper, the Viper two and the M two, you're going to have much larger print areas. I'm not going to set this on it, but as you can see here. Hang on. Let me let me get a let me get an upper camera view as I step in front. And of this Maria. is the default print area. Here we go on an M2, all right? This is the default print area on both the Epson and the Brother machine, that whether it's illustration right the, there. the 341, 361, 381. If you want to get an idea of how big their optional was, go two inches wider, and two inches taller. And it's still not. And it's still, it's still you not know, that, that size. That's still not that that's size. That's a big deal. And even over here, on the, M2, on the Viper 2, you'll see we have pretty much the same thing. Because these actual the print areas on these two printers? Yeah, it's a little harder to see yeah, because it's the long way. Right, there we go. It's the same print field, it just rotated by 90 degrees, all right? That's one big differentiation. Oh, by the way, in case you didn't notice, there are four shirts on this one. What? Right? It'll print more and than, more than one shirt at a time? More. And on this machine, we have printed an image that is intentionally not accidentally, larger than the largest print field on either one of our printer competitors, even when they have the optional you, platen. You buy the optional platen, Look right? The size of that now, thing. that shirt, that, that owl's bigger than my belly was six months ago, yeah. right? So cool. that's something you can bring to the table. And I'm going to hand this off to Heath so he can go dry it, because that's a really cool sample. We don't want to waste that one, all right? So 
over here, neither one of the competition printers, of the printers that, the, that our competition sells, are able to do even two shirts at a time, much less four. Somebody's asking here, uh, Paul again is asking about multiple. Yes, the, the platens that we are showing right now are what comes standard with the machine. The M2 comes with two adult platens. These are removable platens, okay? That's another big difference between us and our competition. These platens are removable, which means I can get an additional set of platens and be able to reload while I'm running a print job. The background on the company, the DTG Group, which is a uh, three companies, company out of Sydney, Australia, company out of uh, just outside of London and England and ourselves here in the US, all have a similar background in the embroidery industry, okay? If you've ever done embroidery, if you've ever been around embroidery, you know that it's all about keeping the machine making noise. Because if it ain't making noise, it ain't making money. The only way you do that, and if you look at it in a lot of cases, you'll see that <clears throat> if you buy a two head, you're gonna get four of everything. You buy a six head, you're gonna get 12 of everything. You buy a single head, you're gonna get two of everything. So that you have two sets of everything always. You have one on the machine, one off the machine. It allows you a quicker transition time. We call it uh, interface time here in the DTG camp. And what it's all about is how much time do I have to spend with this printer to get it to print X number of shirts. If I'm doing smaller designs like we did here on these, all right, then I'm gonna to have to touch this machine one time to get four shirts done. If I was printing on one of the competition machines, I would have to touch that machine four times. That's four times that I have to be there and touching the machine, pulling myself away from something else. And on top of that, by printing four designs at once, even though the competition is probably gonna print each one of these individually slightly faster than we will, the difference is I can walk away from this machine for four or five minutes maybe and be able to go do something real. Go make can, a sale. I can make a sale. I can I can go to the bathroom. Yeah. Right? I can I can I can take a fax. I can take the shirts that I've just done, fold them up, get them into a box, yeah. right? I can go over to my embroidery machine, check it, reload the next item onto it. Yep. Another big difference between the DTG brand of machines and the competition. All of it, both machines removable platens. We have a fairly versatile platen system here on the Viper 2, as you can see. I want to hand these shirts off as I go. Yep. That's an example, by the way, of not using white ink on a colored shirt and giving a customer a great result. Yeah. By the way, I don't know if you pointed out, but you're but you're pulling four different designs. Yes. We're not just print, four designs. We, we printed four different designs. Uh, over here, I can do the same thing. We do sell after, you know, a, additional platens for the M2 that will simulate these, yeah. which would be, for most cases, a, a youth shirt, a infant shirt. I, you know, I have customers who use these to do chest prints. So they can load up four shirts for chest prints at the same time. Really a huge benefit when you can set it up, walk away, and know that four shirts are getting done all at once. Name and drops. you're able to do a lot, a lot more around your office than you were before. I want to clear a couple of our questions out here. We got a bunch of questions. You guys are asking some great questions. So, I mean, that kind of addresses the versatility. And we didn't show you on, online, but before we get out of here, I will jump up and I will show you the platen options. We have them on our, on oh, our, yeah, that's on our DTG printer machine site to see the options we have for platens. We don't sell a lot of actual optional platens on this. We have them, but the 421 system necessary. on the Viper yeah. 2 is so uh, versatile because you can print two across, you can print one full, or you can print four smaller. Um, thanks, Margie. The, the standard platen for the for the Viper 2 is this right here, which is our 421 platen system, all right? Four 7.5 by 11.5, or you can do two 11.5 by 16.5, or one 16.5 by 24. That's a standard platen system for this. About the only one people generally will buy as an after for this is a dual sleeve platen. Right. Um. Patty wants to know, how long did you say it takes to print a shirt? Five oh, no, minutes no, no, no. per shirt? It was less than five minutes to print all five of, all four of those shirts. Right. right. But I could walk away for five minutes, whereas if I were printing them on a Brother or an Epson, every minute or so, no, those didn't have a white underbase. Every minute or so, they would have to be loading another yes. shirt, and they would have that gap while they take that wet shirt off of the machine, they walk over to a heat press, they put the shirt on the heat press, close the heat press, pick up the next shirt, walk back over and put it on the printer. What was happening from that whole time when I said pick up a shirt, 
and start printing again. Nothing. The printer was doing nothing. Whereas with the the Viper 2, with the, either of our machines, with the extra platens, all right, you're able to have the next set prepared so that have another platen set up already. Right. So while Don is doing this on a table, on a table, and the so next four would small, already be printing. Instead of a four. small warm room. Right. <laughs> I mean, here again, here's another example, guys. And this is not something unique to us. All right. Anybody can do this. This is stuff people miss. You can do this kind of stuff on light colored shirts. That looks awesome. It really looks nice and it looks like it's almost dyed into the shirt and pennies to print. All right. So, you know, hopefully I answered your question. The print times are when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about printing the entire print area, right? right. These are like, we have cappers like this to do two adult, it kind of blends into my shirt, talk about camo. Yeah. All right, cappers to cover up to do two shirts like that. We also have the full size capper, which would allow us to do basically do the owl over here on this printer as well. I, I think Patty really wants to get some idea of how long it takes to print a shirt with a white underbase. General rule is it's going to take twice as long. <laughs> okay. Because you're doing two passes. When we talk in, in the direct to garment world, we talk in terms of passes through the printer, okay. right? And so when I'm doing a dark shirt, I'm doing two passes. Now, if I'm printing on a light shirt, like if I was going to wanting to print white, say it was a soccer ball or something on one of those light green or light blue shirts, then I might put a light white underbase, which will print pretty quick. Uh, the brother does three to four passes. You can, I mean, you know, I don't see that much of the brother. It's more common I see doing multiple passes uh, on the Epson. One of the differences when you start to talk about inks where we start to differentiate because you are looking at three machines with three totally different ink sets, right? Right. Actually four, because we offer two different ink sets on these machines, okay? But the the viscosity, the, the level of white in our ink allows us to do one pass under base for the white and then a one pass of color. On the Epsons, most of the prints that you see here that are really high quality and really popping color, they've had to do two passes of white because they have a lower viscosity ink that doesn't have as much of a pigment load, all right? While we're on the ink, let's talk about ink prices. And, and if, if you think that the physical differences were a big deal between the, the print set, the ink is an equally big Yeah, deal. it's very big difference. Uh, Brother's pretty secretive about their inks uh, because people started finding out ahead of time what the inks cost. I believe somebody said they own a brother, and uh, I think it's Paul, right? Um, can testify to ink prices. You have a 381. Yeah. You're probably spending in the area of about $350 Four hundred dollars for your white ink. What, when you figure out the liter price, why don't you why don't you show them the table on the right. on the slideshow? Uh, where's that at? Uh, switch over to the. All right. By the way, we're getting ready you to change to the computer. Don't turn off the camera this time. We're going to try right. something new. All right. And then just go down to the presentation down there. Which is presentation right there. Thanks. The P. P. All right. Okay. Then, just click. click. All right. Can you all see the screen? The brother versus the DTG features here. Okay, cool. No, good question, Patty. Um, <laughs> Paul said, by the way, how much is the ink? He just said expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why would it be, you're right, why is it less expensive than my transfers I can press in five se seconds? Good question, Patty. How much did the transfers cost you? How long did it take for them to get to you? And how many did you have to commit to to be able to have those transfers there? I can print one off at a time and I can have it done in a matter of a minute or two, right? Uh, you gotta commit to eight sheets uh, for most people for transfers and you've gotta get them ordered, get them there. And if you're gonna print them on light shirts and dark shirts, you're gonna have to di differentiate between that or else you're putting a white underbase on all your light colored shirts which drives your price way up. Those designs I was just showing you in the software we were looking at, they, they was like 68 cents to print all, no, I'm sorry, with the owl, 64 cents and the four over here were less than about seven or eight cents a piece to print. All right, much less expensive than your transfers, right? And I understand that it's, it's not just about time though. What you did is you traded five minutes, five seconds of time while you were pressing, I get it. But guess what? You didn't have to stand here at the printer either the whole time it was printing. The machine did the work for you and then you throw them in the heat press and you, and you went on. So. I hear where you're coming from, and you know what? Transfers are not necessarily 
a, a competitor to direct the garment. They, they are probably taking the biggest hit to it. There still are applications for it. Let me go back to our presentation here. Here's the comparison of sizes. See the print DPIs. Multi-shirt printing, no, only we do that. White ink, no, for the 341. Paul has the 381. Um, by the way, a great question, Paul, and I'll get to that in one second. RIP softwares. We're all the way down here to the RIP software, all right? The Brother 341, 361, 381 do not come with a print driver. They do, however, offer an aftermarket RIP that is written by a company called Cadlink. Um, absolutely, Paul, you can. Or is that Paul? Paul I, I can't see your whole name, sorry. Um, absolutely, you do have the ability to use Cadlink because that's what we include with our printer at no additional charge. Uh, they, they came to, after seeing the results that we had, with the CadLink product about four and a half, five years ago, Brother approached CadLink to generate an OEM aftermarket rip for them to sell for their machines, all right? And subsequently, by the way, Epson did the same thing. We include it with ours, we call it Rip Pro C6, but the interface is identical for both the Brother and the Epson, obviously with their tweaks for their specific machines. It is a option with both machines. I've seen it for as low as $750, I've seen it for as high as about twelve hundred dollars for yeah. that rip, but it's, it's never included free. Yeah. with our machine. Interchangeable platens, yes. The difference is on the brother machines; they are hardwired basically to it, so you have to be able to uh, to adjust. Paul, I'm just state reading what's on the screen. You need it, or you have horrible color on the brother, especially purples, right? Um, trainings available. We do our training free online live. Instructor-led training. We have two offices, one in New Jersey, one in Tampa, where we do training. And then we have a backup of a refresher, basically. We, we've stripped the material out of the training and put it in a digital format so that you can go back and review it up on our website as well. So you basically see the PowerPoint, the videos, and everything that are used during the training classes to be able to go back to. And uh, our tech talks. And their tech talks. We have our tech talks as well. Um, that's a huge, huge differentiation. When you're dealing with Epson, for the most part, you're interfacing with Epson technicians who really don't know anything about the textile side of the marketplace. Right. They're printer technicians. Printer uh, so you're kind of at the mercy of your, your dealer. There are a couple of really good dealers that do sell the Epson printers who do know their stuff, but there are a lot of companies that are just moving boxes for Epson that do not understand that side of the, in the industry. So all they're gonna do is refer you to Epson and you're going to just be in a queue with a bunch of other people and probably be being addressed by someone who doesn't understand the, right. the textile industry. While we're there, I'm going to brag a little bit on our technicians. We have the majority of our technicians have real world experience. What I mean by that is that they actually have worked in the field on the printers, on the embroidery machines, whatever type of equipment we sell, you know, rhinestone machines. We've, we've had them doing everything. Yeah. that in a real world production environment so they not only can answer your questions in the sense of a you know hey it's if a, a then b it's, it's in the manual dummy yeah. type of questions right <clears throat> they can also answer hey how do i do this on the machine i'm trying to print on this i'm trying to embroider on this yeah okay and it, the thing that mark mentioned there about the tech talk webinars uh we just finished one up right before we came in here uh, JR was in our, our other training room, right. and he was doing a webinar, it was one of our Tech Talk webinars, which is something for our existing customers. And what it is, is basically we, we chain a technician to the machines for about an hour yeah. with, a, with a computer and a, a, monitor, a camera in front of him. And we start off on a subject, but then you run with it. Yeah. And you, you know it could be issues you're having, it could be tweaks you need, it could be trip tricks, anything yeah. like that. So right? so Heath has done done things like for, yeah. for DTG as that's Heath. Um, he's done things for DTG like, you know, how to identify pre-treat issues. Yep. Um, he's done, you know, basic maintenance. So Paul has a good question. How long does it take for us to get back? I'm gonna open up a little more because I think I was calling Paul a Paul. Sorry, Paul. Um, how, we're, we're usually back in within a week or two. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, Jeez. Yes. Now I have to edit that out. I mean, typically uh, your calls are answered when you call in within a, a couple hours, a lot of cases, even less than that. 
Um, if it's a simple question, the techs a lot of cases will, if you give them the option to, they will respond to you by email very quickly. Uh, in a lot of cases, because there, you know, there, there are issues and there are, it's in the manual dummy type of questions, right? right? And if it's in one of those situations or it's an error code or something like that, if there's a, a link that they can send you to, a PDF, a video, they'll shoot you a link real quick as well that you can get to. Um, the guys leave here every night with virtually all the tech support calls that have come in having been called back or emailed. That doesn't mean that every issue is resolved every single day. That happens if you, know, you have as many machines in the field as right. we do, it happens. I can tell you this though, I would say we are probably the only company the size that we are in this industry that has a larger support infrastructure than we do a sales infrastructure. Yeah, here's something else I'll mention, Paula, is at the end of every day, our support manager and the owner of the company get an open ticket report. Yes. So they personally know if any machine is down in our uh, cold SE universe, right. as, as we and said. And the number, by the way, typically that would be down would be far under this number, less than a handful. Yes. Typically it's one or two, and those are not issues that are, their decisions are ongoing. We're trying to troubleshoot it down to, to get it back up and as quick as possible and running. So, plus, you know, we have with every machine that goes out of here, we include a webcam. So typical situation, you buy your printer and before you even get the printer, what's going to happen is you're going to have a box show up that's going to have instructions, very straight instructions. Which the first we still instruction don't have says, a sample to show you. The first instruction says, open the box. Right. right? It's pretty basic. And yeah. it's very straightforward. By the way, if you fail any of the first two <laughs> steps, <laughs> then, then we'll take it. We're going to ask that you just send it back, we'll send you your money, and we won't ship you your printer, right? Um, but open the box, you go through, it has instructions on how to sign up for training. It has instructions to do whatever you need to do with the printer to unload it or the embroidery machine to get the stand built, all of those type of things. And there's a package of popcorn in there, microwave popcorn, so that while you're watching all these videos, you can enjoy some yes. popcorn. I lobbied hard for Merlot to go with it. <laughs> But unfortunately, uh, that got we can't snubbed. ship that o over over yeah, state lines. Yeah, and we can't ship. Uh, that you also over. get a a free T-shirt to make mistakes with. Right, exactly. Um, practice gets rolled shirt. up in there. It's great. Can we send our graphic artist down to train? Absolutely, Paula. Uh, there's no cost. Thank you. Very good question. How much does training cost? It costs you nothing. The only training you would ever pay for would be if you had us send a tech to you. You'd have travel expenses and whatnot. If you saw the way he ate, you would not want to go there. <laughs> I'm not uh, a cheat day. Right. <laughs> That's terrifying. I cannot unsee that. Yeah, that's um, anyway, uh, you, so your your online classes, your classroom classes, those are free as long as you own the machine. So here's an answer. So Paula, a year from now, you hire a new operator that's going to run one of these machines. What do you do? You can either A, plug them into a online classroom, which we do at least once a month on each machine. Um, and we do classroom three times a month between the two locations. One, once on each in Jersey, we do two training classes here. The M2s, we don't sell quite as many up. M2s over here, right? No, no it's over there. Way. The M2 over there, right? The M2s, we do those Damn, trainings okay. about once a month. The Viper 2 is generally twice a month in-house. Okay, you're looking at the M2, great. Dana, yes, you can have somebody come to you. It's your option. It's not something that most people do because it's not inexpensive, all right? We don't build it into the cost of the machines like other companies do because we have real technicians that answer real questions on these machines. We don't have technicians that uh, yesterday they were working on a Yugo, tomorrow they're working on a Volkswagen, right? right? Our technicians work on DTG machines and really, I mean, this is between me, you, and the fence folks. Don't let, well, I guess the world knows right now. The training that we do live online is the best training that there is yeah. because it is driven by a PowerPoint. It is driven by exams all the way through it. It's driven by a script, right? The guy who presents the class is the guy who wrote all of those. has been with this company since its inception. We have the best trainer on the marketplace that does that. And it's absolutely consistent every single time. That's huge. All right. Having somebody there may feel like a warm fuzzy, but what's going to happen is if you have somebody there is you're going to get carried away with stuff and because there's no structure to it, right? you're not going to get through all of the steps. We've yeah. done this. We, we did, used to do installs 
on the Viper on the M2. That's why the M2 is four thousand dollars less expensive now than it used to be. Right. We used to build in the price of an install into it, and we had more problems with customers who were trained on live on their locations than we did on people who either came to our location or who went through our live online. Yeah, training. you know what you can do, uh, Dan, if you want to, is you can go to support.coldse.com. Right. And you can even look through all of our online trainings and just right. see what it's like to own and operate and maintain right. one of the machines. But the answer is yes. If you want to pay for somebody to come to you, they will. That's absolutely an option. Um, you know what I didn't do? I don't think I did the brother comparison. So let's pop up. We we did a brother comparison. Let's go through and let's do the Epson. The Epson. Oh yeah, the ink. Oh, we didn't do the ink comparison. Through, yeah. We started talking to it. Paula went off and said price was expensive for ink. Yes. These are real numbers, guys. That six hundred dollar range is what it breaks down to roughly per liter on their colors, and three fifty on their white. Why are their color ink six hundred dollars a liter? Because they can be. They have an exclusive cartridge and an exclusive ink to the marketplace. And their earlier machines, the 541, the price of the ink was always that. And they decided to keep it there. Yeah. When they got into the dark printing market, they realized that the average customer is going to use probably five to six times as much white ink. And there was no way in the world that they could get away with $600 a liter white ink. Wow. Or, or your really big print designs would cost you $10 a shirt to print. Yeah. Um, the Viper 243.50 liter cost that's based on buying a set of cartridges for a little under 293 dollars which is 1.2 liters of ink and the bulk ink for the m2 180 a liter for colors 200 for white now when you compare the epson you guys been able to see this whole screen yeah they should be okay oh there we go go back here here your print area breakout print on darks absolutely print areas you can see the comparison right there Every time I touch the screen, it goes away, Marky. Yeah, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. So listen, I'm new to this. Different types of the print heads, same multi-shirt printing. Yes, on the Viper 2, not on the the Epson. Uh, both use cartridge-based tanks. Both use good cartridge-based tank. The other degassed, very good. Standard warranty on the Epsons, one year. They're more than happy to sell you a second year. I think it's 19.95. It's in that range. That's two thousand dollars, not twenty dollars, right? Uh, the rip software that comes standard with it is called Garment Creator. And anybody who may have an Epson that is in this crowd will probably attest to the fact that it's no bueno. Um, again, most people buy afterwards. They buy the Cadlink rip for it. There are a couple of other good rips floating around for it, but it's an added charge, $750 to $1,200 for the aftermarket rip. Uh, auto, the platen height detection, absolutely interchangeable platens, yes. However, once again, the Epson platen is fixed to the machine. It remor requires that you physically detach it from the machine put another one in. It's not a practical quick change. Whereas with the Viper, because it's belt driven, you can have the second platen ready, loaded, bang, and in and up printing. Training, you do get training with the Epson. The quality of that's gonna vary on the distributor that you get it from. Right. With us, we have the free online training or at our, our offices or for its fee, we'll do a live online. Toll free support uh, by both, right? Yep. Uh, oh, I gotta quit rolling a mouse and stuff, man. Go back. There we go. And here's the Epson price breakout. The Epson inks are $345 a liter. That's based on buying the 600 milliliter cartridges for $207. Do the math. Divide by six. Multiply by ten. Gotcha. Right? Viper two, just like we've shown before. M two, just like we've shown before. Okay. Question. We have a question. I'm coming back to you here in a second. As soon as I can figure this stuff out. All right. We have a question. This is from Dana. All right, what about cleaning cleaning heads and clogging between the three? Good great, question. Great yeah. question. Number one, all the good printers on the marketplace. Quit reading the crap that's on the internet from five, six, seven, eight years ago. Yeah. All right? Or from nine, people that owned one five, six, seven, right. eight years ago. Understand that. All these machines, when well maintained, are not going to clog on you every 15 minutes. All right? Um, Inks have gotten better. Systems have gotten better. Okay, uh, all of these machines are going to do a good job. On the Viper 2, we have a highly pressurized system here, and a very short set of ink lines. The ink lines start right here, and they wrap to right there. Very short ink lines, less place for the for the inks to settle in the line. Mainly, the main when we talk about the concerns are about white ink, color inks, 
if you have problems with color inks in your printer, you either use some really crappy ink or somebody is doing something bad to your printer. The color inks in the marketplace, they're very solid. All right? Uh, yeah, you can, are you not seeing a full screen of me, Dana? What you need to do is if you've got a just snowflake. Just turn off the mo turn off the monitor button. I'm gonna turn off the monitor and see. Now can you see me? You may want to try hitting your snowflake. There we go. Sorry, we had both of those on. All right. So Dana didn't see what I just did. None of y'all did. So right here is where the ink lines start on the Viper 2. They come around to right here. They're less than 18 inches long. Very short ink line. On the M2, on the back side of the machine, we actually have an ink circulation system that circulates and stirs our white ink during periods of inactivity. So what you used to hear were nightmares with these printers about sitting them, letting them sit and whatnot. Basically, what used to be things that scared you on a daily basis are things you need to worry about weekly. Things you worried about weekly now are pretty much monthly. A lot of the stuff we used to worry about monthly is just stuff you may maybe take care of once every six months, eight months on a machine. Yeah. There's the basics of it, and we're the only company on the market that I know does this. And I'll, it's probably easier to do it this way instead of making people seasick, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is the plate. If you can see that, you don't need to read it. But every one of our printers goes out with a maintenance schedule printed right on top yeah. of the printer. It's up here on the on the M2. And honestly, if you if you really want to know what that 10 minutes is like. Uh, you can go, 10 minutes a day, is you can go, um, you can go to the support.coldessie.com site and just look for a video on it and watch someone do it. Right. You basically, what you're going to do is you're going to come in in the morning, do a couple head cleanings, do a nozzle check, and if everything's hunky-dory, you're good to go. Yeah. Now, when do you do your serious maintenance? After production. Just like any other tool, right? What you're going to do with every other, every one of your other tools, when you're done with it, you put it away clean, right? So after I just done a production run of shirts, I am going to clean up around the edges of my print head. I am going to clean my capping station with a little bit of a cleaning solution that we include with the system with a syringe, right? I'm going to check my encoder strip maybe once a week or so to see if it's getting dirty, clean that. And I'm going to clean the wiper blade and around the edges of the capping station and a spit station. That's the majority of the maintenance you're going to do on days you use the machine. If you don't use the machine today, all you end up doing is just your your basic head and nozzle check and, and uh, head cleaning and nozzle check. Yeah. You're good to go. Paula, what's the cost of maintenance? If you're not using the machine, you're using less than a dollar a day worth of consumables. If you are using the machine, you're probably going to use another $2 or so at the end of the day worth of ink and also yeah. uh, the cleaning solutions. Can you compare that to Brother and Epson? Um, Brother, it's hard to tell. Uh, I know that the brother does does uh, require a flush of the system a little more regularly. I want to say it's once a quarter or so. Um, the the Epson machine is the is the real hog when it comes to the cost of maintenance. All right, um, waste ink. Correct. Yeah. The, with the Epson printer, depending on how much you use it, the least frequently would be every six weeks. The most frequently would be every two weeks. You have to do a system flush. It's required by the firmware of the machine, <clears throat> and it's also required to maintain your your warranty, right. which means basically you're going to flush out the white ink that's in the lines of the machine, which... And how much was that white ink again? It's, it, it, it's a lot. It this way. The round trip on a system flush on the Epson, right, you basically are looking at about $140, $150 round trip with the ink and the flushing solution you use for it. And then secondarily, they have a special little device in there that instead of a wiper blade, I call it a little butt wiper. It's like a little toilet paper roll that rolls across the bottom of the print head. That is a consumable of the machine that needs to be replaced about once a month, and it's a little over $90. I think the most common price I've seen for it on the Internet is $95. Average on, at cost of ownership of an Epson that's printing zero shirts is about $200 a week. All right, That's what goes down the drain. Okay? Um, Paul is saying, and you flush if you do not use after 72 okay, on, hours. On your brother, which again, we don't we don't recommend. If somebody asks me about flushing your machine, it may be something you would do annually, uh, biannually. If you're printing a lot with the machine, no. you don't need to Heath worry about it. Heath is out there saying no. Our, our technician is saying, don't do not do that. About all the Viper 2s, you flush it about every three to four months. Three to four months. Okay. There you go. Three, Sorry. You flush it through a standard set of cartridges. Yeah, you have a standard. Okay. 
This cartridge right here is in ninth position. It's a flushing cartridge. Your machine's going to come with a set of eight of those. Actually, the one's in at nine. You can flush the, the lines with that. Again, the more you print, the less you have to worry about it. The less you print, the more you have to worry right. about it because of settling. Other questions? Oh, Margie, do you need a preach to recharge? Yes, a good, that's a good question. One thing in common with all of the printers, everybody who prints white ink, you do have to pre-treat right. the white ink, okay? That's just the nature of where this industry is at, all right? You do have to pre-treat. Um, our pre-treat's among the least expensive. Ours is sold in the logical size containers. Uh, brother tries to push on you 20 liter drums, which are five gallon buckets. Um, the same thing with with Epson, there's at least is dilutable. So you buy a five gallon bucket, it makes two five gallon buckets of pre-treat. Wow. Uh, the cost of pre-treating ours, 25 to 30 cents a shirt. Uh, when you start to look at the brother, it can get as high as if you buy their sheets over a dollar a shirt to pre-treat. Brothers is diluted two to one. Okay. So uh, yeah, it's diluted two to one. But basically you have to have the facility to do that. Right. And you know, it's, Epson doesn't even offer, or they just, I think, just started to finally offer a pre-treatment machine. Okay. That's how out of the groove they were with all of this. They came to market without a rip that was any good and without a pre-treatment machine. And they're two years in, and they're just now starting to get these type of things right. down, right? And Paul wants to know, do you suggest pre-treat for brighter colors on non-white? That's your call. You can do it. Um, there's some after, we sell aftermarket white, white light garment pre-treatments here. It absolutely, it will give you better, more pop on the shirt, but any time that you use a pre-treat, what it's doing is it's holding the ink higher up in the shirt. That means as the shirt starts to degrade, you're going to have more fallout off of the shirt if you're using a lower grade shirt. Problem with staining on whites. Paula, Paula, no, Paula, Paula knows Paula. what she's talking yes. about. Yes, you know, Paula, no, you don't. Not with, with ours because ours don't have the same chemicals in it. The early pre-treats around the market did have a problem with UV instability. All right. And uh, we're a little fuzzy right now. There we there go. go. Um, no, you do not have that. That staining is a UV stain. What happens is they react to it, right? <laughs> yeah, I know you have to use the Brother Pre-Treat. No, their Pre-Treat's not meant to be used on light-colored shirts because there's a, there's a chemical in it, I forget what it is, that when it's exposed to UV light, it taints. Trust me, I, I showed our, one of our ink manufacturers early on that we had this problem on light, lighter-colored shirts, people having yellowing on the shirts, yeah. changing the color of the shirts. When they pre-treated to print white ink on it, they didn't believe me. We're in Florida, which is about 17 miles from the sun. <laughs> it's a UV right? capital of and the universe. So I took and literally sprayed a white shirt with the pre-treat, pressed it, set it out on our dumpster. It came back into the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, I went in and I picked up the shirt and I threw it out. And it had yellowed. So they went to work and they changed up the pre-treatment formula. So now it doesn't yellow yeah. in the sun. Okay. I mean, I think we've addressed... Uh, virtually everything that I can think of about the machines, you know, uh, I'll brag on us a little bit. We've been at it longer than either one of them in the direct to garment price. Yep. Uh, you, I think you, you put that price. It came out, Paula. You, you, um, you personally have probably been at it for longer than any of the other competitors in the market. Pretty as much. Well, I think there's one guy who's been in the market longer than I have, really am actively involved in it. Maybe two, and uh, they, he works for a competitor. Right. But there's a, there's a handful of us who's been this at this since the beginning, and you know trust me when I when I seem to be a little short about the, when I hear people complain about the challenges with white ink and all this, it's because we've lived it, guys. No, we don't have problems now. You know the problems that are out there are most of the time induced by either a bad environment, um, uh, somebody just not following Technique. The procedural, yeah. not being trained properly. Uh, it's very seldom is it the the inks. The inks are very stable. And so, you know, the, I'm not going to The equipment pressure. works. The equipment works. Is it infallible? No. But the, the equipment, by and large, works on a regular basis consistently. And we have customers who run, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine of these machines. At a peak, we had one customer who's running 30 of these machines. We have a large customer up in um, Toronto area that runs 12 M2s at the same time. And they really, really do. What environment, Margie? Good question. Um, uh, yeah, Erie PA, Erie that's, PA, that's the one yeah. I was talking about, Paul. Um, what environment is needed? With just about all of the, the direct to garment printers, you need fairly humid for a lot of you uh, situations. You know, 50% and upwards, nice, all right? Uh, temperatures that you're comfortable in. The inks will start to slow down when you start to get into the 50s, and you'll start to see some performance issues with that.
but you know if you're in a drying climate say you're if you're east of the mississippi you don't have much of yeah, a problem fine. right except during the winter when you're running dry heat then you probably need to hum run a humidifier you'll notice that right here we actually have a hygrometer on our machine actually this is a a little earlier version of the m2 the current m2s actually have a built-in hygrometer right here all right you can't see what i'm pointing at because i'm in a way right there there's actually a hygrometer on the current one we typically tell our customers to go out and buy one of these hygrometers they're about 10 bucks or 12 bucks and, and paul is testifying the fact that 15 percent 75 degrees how many shirts can you print realistically before you need to clean an m2 good question guy um if you're doing uh, large white prints, you may have to do one every half dozen. I mean, if we took that owl that I was printing, you may have to do a head cleaning every, you know, half a dozen prints. Uh, if you're doing average type shirts, we found we've done some pretty extensive testing on the Viper 2. M2 is fairly similar. You're generally going to have to a consistent back to back to back to back to back dark shirt printing. Probably about every 20 shirts or so, you're going to have to do a head cleaning just because it's hard for it to keep up and, with it. And Paula just said yeah. that. We do about every 20 with heavy white. Exactly. If you're just doing color shirts, you can go all day. You know, if you're doing light, like if we were just printing the owl, yeah. I'd print those all day because it has plenty of time to recover and the inks aren't as obnoxious. We're not demanding as much. Understand a white out underbase for that owl would be six times as much ink as is in the owl. Right. So if I have to do a head cleaning every six 12 shirts, 10 shirts on that, I'd be every 50 or 60 shirt. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, what know. is, uh, let's see, what cost? By the way, Paula, Paula had a question about okay. uh, price. Paula, we're trying to record this for perpetuity. <laughs> I will talk to you or have your, <laughs> sales your, your salesperson give you pricing on the machines. Um, we are very price competitive with the Epson with this machine, and we're very price competitive with the brother. 381 with this machine. You'll be excited to talk to us. You'll be glad well, to Let's, let's it, put it okay? that way. Uh, uh, what is... Yes, Viper 2 is 110 volt. Both are 110 volt. Uh, head cleanings. Screen versus DTP. Oh, good question. That's another webinar we've actually yeah. done. Um, so let me ask, ask you a question. Dana, are you a screen printer? No. Okay. Cheaper. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Screen printing is a, is a complex process, right? Um, you have to, the artwork has to be done. We have to do artwork for DTG. You got to do artwork for screen printing. When the artwork's done, somebody mashes a print button, okay? With DTG. Somebody mashes a print button. Mark doesn't know what he's talking about. Let me finish. No. Uh, the difference is when I mash the print button with DTG, I'm printing on a t-shirt. When I match the print button as a screen printer, I'm printing film positives, all right? Those film positives are gonna be a clear material that I'm actually going to take, it's gonna be printed in black, the area's clear, the black area is gonna be the area that I want to print, and then I'm gonna take those films, I'm gonna take them over to a screen. The screen's gonna be coated with an emulsion that's photosensitive, so I'm doing this in an area with like a black light, like a black, like a dark room. I'm then gonna lay the the screen down, the, the, the print down on the screen. We're going to put it in a unit that's called an exposure unit. We're going to close the exposure unit. It's going to vacuum the air out of it. Well, bright lights. We, we literally on. did an hour webinar on just right? these different things. And it's going to expose the screen. The screen will be good. I'm going to take the screen out. I'm going to go into a, a washout bin very quickly before the light gets to the emulsion that's in the area I didn't want to turn hard. I'm going to spray it out, right? That's for one color of screen printing. Now, what I have to do is I have to take it up and hold it up to a light. And look, if there are any pinholes in it, if there are any pinholes in it, what do I do? I tape the pinholes off, right? Right? This is for one color. We're not done yet. If I was going to do a four color job, there would be registration marks on those screens. I would do all these things to all four of these screens. Now, I finally get to walk over to my press. Go to my press, I'm going to mount my screens up, I'm going to put a thing called a Pellon down on the palette, and I'm going to swipe my first color, right? And it's also going to print the registration marks, right? Because I haven't taped those off. Now I'm going to bring the second color over. I'm going to lower the screen down. I'm going to try to register it with my eyeballs as best as I can. And I'm going to go ahead and lock it down. I can swipe with the thing. And hopefully it registers then. Go through and do that to all the colors I'm going to print. Now, I'm still not ready yet because I have to clean off the areas where the registration marks are, tape off those so ink doesn't flow through there because we don't want registration marks on a t-shirt. 
Now, I can start printing t-shirts, right? The guys with DTG are already at the bar drinking beer, right? That's a big difference. However, if I'm going to do one color shirts that say staff on the back in solid black, and I need to do 400 of them, I'm going to burn one screen, I'm going to have a guy sitting there just whacking out those shirts left and right all day long and making $1.75 a shirt, and that's what it's meant to do. This is not to replace screen printing exclusively, right? Paula cuts it off at 50, that's because your ink's so expensive, Paula. All right, <laughs> I can give you an argument that I can print 150, 200 light colored shirts cheaper than you can set up screens for a four color job. Wow, and, right? and don't forget about the space requirements and, and things like right? that. Right, so you get less space required. Again, this is not a battle between screen printing and direct to garment. It's about using the right tool for the right situation. And it's also about offering your customer something they may not get somewhere else. If you're a screen printer and you can offer your customers options, right, to be able to do oversized and undersized shirts without having to pay for extra screen charges, it's huge. Because now you can take that customer and when they come in and they got, you know, the guy comes in to deliver it, weighs 360 pounds, right? Yeah. He's doing shirts, and you're seeing, you know, that the artwork they're giving you is 10 inches by 12 inches, and it's really like a postage stamp on this guy's chest. Get a 3X or a 2X shirt for him, size it up as large as your printer will allow you to size it and print it. Yeah. And then offer it for his right. kids. You can do undersized, right? You can do variability as well. There are a lot of, we're doing maintenance behind us right now for putting the printer to the bed putting our printer to sleep in the background. So there is a big difference here. Variability of data. Uh, I had a customer, this is the craziest, I think, example of variability. He printed t-shirts for a motorcycle rally every year, and your t-shirt was your raffle ticket. And every t-shirt had a different barcode on it. Oh, that is awesome. So as you went around idea. the vendors, they would shoot you with the barcode. You'd be entered into raffles and everything. That is a great idea. All the graphic was the same except for the barcode. Yeah. All right? Screen print that. Right? Right. So lots of different things you can do with it. You know, fill-ins. When you've, when you've done a large order for a customer, and the, anybody who's ever done screen printing knows the day after you reclaim the screens is the day your biggest customer comes back and with 27 more of that shirt. Or one. Oh, one. So it's much quicker just to do a, a fill-in with direct-to-garment. And what you do is you give them a direct-to-garment printed shirt when you deliver that large order and give them the option, right? How does this print on 50-50 just like everybody else? Going to do pretty good, right? It's not going to get as bright colors on, poly, on higher poly counts that you will on higher cotton counts, but it'll do fine. You just have to set the realistic expectation. I would not mix 50-50s with 100% cottons for the same, on the same order because they're not going to look the same. Just like I wouldn't mix brands of shirts, even if they're 100% cotton, or 50-50 on the same order. Okay? Um, yeah, different size, different shirts. Paula is talking about here. Um, I, I, I personally like to, to call it the 8 12 principle. Take the design, 8 inches for the smallest, 10s for the mediums, 12s for the largest. It's just a number, but it gives you an idea of how you address the shirt. Does it print on uh, surfaces other than t-shirts? Yes. In fact, Mark was just getting ready to run to my I, desk. I was. Here I go. Run to my desk and get some wood. And also, he was going to grab one of our pre-printed um, canvases that are out there. And, uh, man, I thought he would never leave. Uh, we'll show you that in a second, Dana. Other questions while we're at it about these, you know, things. That, by the way, this, this, this wood... That uh, is about to be brought in here to me. It's actually something done by one of our customers uh, who are up in um, Tennessee outside of Nashville. This is actually an art canvas. For those of you who uh, go shop at Michael's, we get these from Michael's. This is an art canvas that was printed out on a DTG. All right. Very straightforward, simple, quick little pre treat on the, the canvas. And then we clear, we did. Uh, clear coated after it had dried. Uh, pre treatment for ours is depending on what volume you buy it in, but it's in the area of sixty to eighty dollars a gallon. It costs you about a quarter to thirty five cents or so for sure to pre treat. Um, you're going to see on the brothers that they're going to be in the thirty five to a dollar range, depending on which pre treat you use. And you, they're a lot more particular about pre treat. They actually have you weigh it 
in a lot of cases and make sure it's consistent. Um, these are wedding invitations printed on wood by a customer of mine in Nobleton, uh, not Nobleton, Nolensville, Nashville, it's a, sub, uh, a suburb of Nashville. They also, at the weddings, this is their pricing schedule. They print these for coasters, and Maria just decided she wants some. Maria, our um, marketing assistant, is getting married soon, and, and, and she's melting. And these are almost with immeasurable price. amounts of ink yeah. that are on these. And again, you can see what they charge. Just incredibly profitable. All right. Uh, so those are some examples of stuff. We've actually printed, uh, Heath has printed signs for behind a bar where they have the different beers that are on tap that you can just hang just different signs on the bottom of them as well. Um, stone coasters, yeah, the same as you can with the brother, absolutely, on that. Uh, Dana, no, we won't. We actually don't do trade shows anymore. We do these. We do these. Yeah. We've invested the resources that we would waste on trade shows yeah. doing these. Trade shows, if you've been in the industry as long as I have, been in the industry for 26 years. The first trade show I went to, there were almost 600 vendors at and well over 20,000 people attending. The trade show you're talking about in Arlington, there will probably be 140 vendors at and 2,500 people at. They're just about making money for the convention centers and the groups that put on the trade shows. What we're doing here is much more, much more beef. And it, it actually allows us, if you want to demo of this machine one-on-one, -on -one, give me a call. We'll set one up live. You send me the artwork you want to see printed. We'll do it just like you and I are doing right here, except I'll have you turned on so I can hear you instead of just having you type. And when we're done, I'll send you the shirt, and you'll see what the what they can do. And neither one of us had to leave our room. You could be drinking. I'm not allowed to drink at work anymore. Anymore. Um, what about printing photographs with Viper 2 on T-shirts? I mean, I... The, the canvas the was canvas the, is an example that right that was done on the viper too all right it was just it was printed on a canvas same thing on a t-shirt you would get a very very much the same thing different with the t-shirt is the quality of the t-shirt will vary if you use a really good fine like a, a ring spun cotton t-shirt you get great print you use a cheaper shirt you're going to have you know you know what happens when you polish a turd right you get a shiny turd so if you use an inexpensive shirt something else i have to edit out that's right the comments of Don are not representative <laughs> of... That's very true. Other questions? Before you ask it, Paula, no, we do not take brothers in trade. But you asked something about mixed. Yeah, I've had people mixed. One thing you want to be careful of, even if, um, even if you are using an M2 and a Viper 2 and an M2, this right? Is, this is the M2. Don't print the same job on them. Do do fronts on one, backs on another, all right? Because you cannot identically match across from print head to print head with print engine to print engine and get exactly the same results. You'll never get exactly the same amount of ink down. So you would mix it like that. Um, Niles is asking, are print heads consumables? Yes, print heads are consumables on every single printer in the world. Any kind of a printer. Yes. They, they, they do eventually give up the ghost. You know, piezo, which is the, the materials that you use that make piezo print heads, which are used in this type of printing, have a lifetime. They will only fire so many times. Uh, print head, good question, Paula. Uh, they're going to range from about 1000 to about $1,200 for the print head. There's only one in the machine, unlike uh, the Brother, which you have, which has eight print heads, which are probably more like $1,800 each. Uh, they're $1,200. They come down on them. Okay, so your, your machine yeah, has $9,600 worth of print heads in it, right? Uh, what's the life of the, Niles is asking, what? Sorry, Paula. Poor Paula. Um, what is the life length of the print heads? Uh, they are duty rated for about 30,000 impressions. So if you're using a machine on a regular basis and taking care of and maintaining it, you can expect about 30,000 impressions out of the print head. And so by the way, if you own a brother, brother builds in for their costing, even on their ROI calculator, 51 cents per shirt printed for consumables that are waste consumables. All right, we're not talking about for the shirt, shirt printing itself. That would be for head cleaning, that would be you know, head replacement, damper replacement, all that. They've built in 51 cents, they tell you, to calculate as a cost of doing business with 
the actual printer, all right? With ours, typically it's gonna be about 10 to 15 cents per shirt. You have that number in your head, you're way ahead of the game. Cool. And by I, the way, if you if you have printed 30,000 shirts and you've made about 10 bucks a piece, you've made enough money to, to afford another printer. Right, exactly. And like I said, it's, it's one. Yeah, 51 cents, go up on their ROI calculator. It's 51 cents they build in when they're trying to justify selling the machine to you, is letting you know, even if you print a shirt that uses 37 cents worth of ink, you are to calculate 51 cents extra for the cost of maintenance on the machine for their flushings, for head cleaning, things like that. All right, well, I'm not seeing any more questions pop up now. Um, if you signed up for this and you gave us a valid email and phone number, you will be contacted by your sales manager, yep. your account manager here, sometime in the very near future. Um, if you don't get contacted by them in the next 48 hours, contact us directly. You can reach Mark on our Facebook page. Um, it, it just absolutely get in touch with us. We'll be glad to answer your questions more in depth. Hopefully this kind of enlighten you all a bit of the difference. Like I said, we're not even gonna get into the urination competition about which machine prints better. They all do a great job. And I, again, it's a lot of it has to do with the artwork. A lot of it has to do with your operator. It's just where where is your money best spent? I think we're going to give you the most bang. You give me a wad of cash, I'm going to give you the most equipment back for you, the most support and service. Yeah, that's good. Dana, do we sell apparel as well? We do not, but your account manager can help hook you up with the companies that do. Uh, there's a number of them out there in the field. Is there any new technology coming? What do you think I want to tell you, Niles? Of course there is. Is there anything coming near in the near future? Um, the, the next thing we have in the pipeline is some tweaks to the, hey, I printed the correct printer at that time. Nice. Uh, tweaks to the M2. Um, I don't anticipate seeing anything from that until probably first quarter of 2017. Um, the Viper 2 right now is status quo. Are they working on a next generation of machines? Sure they are. Uh, but mm -hmm. typically with us, we launch machines about every three to four years. Um, we just don't know where it's going to end because you don't know where print technology is going to go. And no, nothing that should motivate you to wait. Correct. White ink improvements, I mean, it's going great. That's, that's really more about the, the chemistry. Yes, we are we are $4 million and four years into a, an ink project with a company right now. We have two employees who are dedicated to working on that project exclusively. But it will be something that will be retroactive to the machines. It's not something that has to do with the machines. We absolutely can trade in, upgrade. If you've got an existent machine and you've had it for less than a year, you have an 80% trade up from Viper, a DTG Viper, brand. Uh, Viper 2 to a an DTG M2 brand. or an M4. Um, if you're past that, we do offer trade ins for current models we still sell. Yeah, there you go. All, all right, right, guys. Thank you very much. Thank for you your all attention. for taking time out tonight. Hopefully, this came out. We had a good recording because I think this one's going to answer a lot of questions for a lot of folks who are searching like you have been. Have a great night, and uh, we will talk to you. Hold on, so Eric. Do you have all, thank you, Eric. Uh, we will answer that in a quick email to you here at the end. We got to get out of here, as you can tell. He's in a hurry. All right. <laughs> thank you guys for coming out. Go Cavs. All right. Take care.